Okay, class, where we are now is to talk about control of respiration. In other words, control of your breathing. Control of your breathing. What we will discuss is the reticular activating formation, brain centers, which are nuclei, central and peripheral chemoreceptors, cortical control, limbic, stretch receptors, the herring brewer reflex, irritant gases, pain, and muscle stretch receptors. So all of these can have some influence on controlling your breathing. All right, let's see what we have here then. We start out with the reticular system and the central nervous system. So we want to speak on that. All right. Right here, I want you to look at your brain centers. Now, we've talked about the heart brain center, the blood vessel. All vital brain centers involve actions of cardiac muscles or smooth muscles. These are involuntary things, except for the breathing center. It involves skeletal muscle. Remember, breathing was the only thing I said that was strange. There was an automatic activity, but it involved the somatic motor nervous system, skeletal muscle. The other systems have backup. The heart has its own internal control. Remember, it had autorhythmicity. You could take it out of the chest, put it in a solution, and keep beating. And other centers also have can, can be controlled. For example, the uh, so we had the cardiac center, and we had the vasomotor center. But the vasomotor center, remember, hormones could dilate and constrict blood vessels. The breathing center is very fragile. If you... If you if your consciousness, that one, this should be, if your consciousness level decreases too much, you will stop breathing. Put that right there. You will stop breathing. So if your conscious level drops too much, you will stop breathing. Okay? Now, what keeps you awake then? All right, so I, our next thing is to talk about the reticular formation in the brain. The reticular. the reticular formation extends throughout the central core of the medulla oblongata pons and stops in the midbrain. Now remember, this brain stem was where all your vital centers are. Okay? It, an intricate, it is an intricate system composed of loosely colored, co uh, clustered neurons in what is, in other words, white matter. Okay? Myelinated stuff. And what it does is arousal, attention, and so forth. Okay, the key to this, I want you to realize, is the neuron firing frequency of the reticular formation determines your states of consciousness. I'll say that again. The neuron firing frequency of the reticular formation determines your states of consciousness. So right now, I'm hoping you're very alert trying to learn this. So your firing frequency is very fast. As you start to go to sleep, the firing frequency gets less and less. If you go into a coma, it is real low. And if you die and have brain death, because that's what determines if you're truly dead, if you have brain death, then there it is. Then, then Now, the key is, though, that breathing center. Uh-oh, here we go. That breathing center needs a certain degree of of neuronal firing of the reticular formation. If it drops too low, the breathing center will cease to function. It'll go to sleep, shall we say. That's the basis of a drug overdose. The basis of a drug overdose is when the firing frequency of the reticular formation gets so low that the breathing center does not work to stimulate the somatic motor neurons to do breathing then obviously if you stop breathing, the heart's going to stop. So the firing frequency of the RAF is very important, particularly with breathing. See, even if, it, even if you knocked out the vasomotor center, you had a blow to the head, if you knocked out the vas or a stroke, if you knocked out the vasomotor center to the brain, then the heart would keep beating. Now the problem would be it wouldn't know when to increase rate or decrease, but it would keep beating. The blood vessels have backup of the hormones. Now you, now you would get a little bit of shock. Remember neurogenic shock. Look back. Neurogenic shock was when the uh, vasomotor center went out, but that was shock. That wasn't death. Okay, knock out the breathing center. The ref 
then that's death. All right, so we go further now. All right, so we won't, we kind of talked on that. All right, now, what kind of control of respiration do we have? Cortical control. Check me out. <sighs> That's not under physiologic. I'm doing that myself and you can too. That's cortical control. That's a voluntary control of breathing. It's not physiologic. It's not under homeostasis, but you can do it. Limbic. Your limbic system, which can com consist of the amygdala, hippocampus, caudate nucleus, things of that nature, that's your pain and pleasure center. That's your emotion area in the brain. You know emotions can make you change your, your breathing. Proprioception is another deal. How are you positioned in space? Let's, let's, let's check something here. How are you positioned in space? See your muscles. That changes your breathing. Whether you're standing up on your head, doing flips, that changes it. Okay? The other thing that can change it are stretch receptors in the lung. You do not want the lung to overinflate. You say, well, why? Because if that, now see, we're back to surface to volume. I want you to think about this. Why do we have a bunch of small alveoli rather than a few big ones? Let me say it again. Why do we have a bunch of small alveoli rather than a few big ones? Okay, that goes back to something called the surface to volume relationship. You see, in a closed room, surface area is length times width. Volume is length times width times depth. So when a closed container gets larger, because the, the volume is a cube turn, length times width times depth, and the surface area is a square turn, then when things get bigger, the volume gets a lot of bigger than the surface area. Well, in the alveoli, where, do, where does oxygen and CO2 have to go through? The surface area. The surface area. So you could get to where if you had only a few alveoli, you'd have a lot of volume, but not enough surface area for, for the O2 and CO2 to go through. So you wanted small, a bunch of small alveoli. Well, then if you start overinflating the lungs, the alveoli will get larger, but that's not helping you. That's not helping you. So thus, we have these stretch receptors. And this, and that will, will cause the, the breathing centers to not allow you to, to breathe that deeply, to stretch. And that's what we call, let me come back to this, the herring brewer reflex. The herring brewer reflex is due to those stretch receptors in the lung trying to prevent you from what? Over distending the lung by constantly breathing too deeply. All right. So, then we have, now, this one here is the one that's the physiologic, ladies and gentlemen. We'll put it in red and bold. That's the one right there that's the physiologic, which are your chemoreceptors. And what your chemoreceptors are checking out, the only three things they're looking at is acid, CO2, and oxygen. Okay. And those are, and then we're going to talk about your central and peripheral ones. So I wanted to talk about that. All right, before we do that, though, let's look at this part, the brain centers. So now we're ready to look at the brain centers that you have involved in respiration, the brain centers. All right, so we're going to come here. And these are the brain centers that you have involved in respiration. This is what I'm going to name. I'm going to say, and you can write this down, okay, but you got the, the PowerPoint. I'm going to say that the area where your brain centers for respiration are is in the area of the pons and the medulla. The usual area for, for all this stuff, the pons and the medulla. I'm going to say we've identified four, and some will say five areas, okay? 
one area here is called the ventral respiratory group. Now see, this is you looking this way. So here you are. This is you looking this way. All right, this is the pond, the bridge. Right here is an area called the, a pontine center called the pneumotaxic center. Called the pneumotaxic center. Okay. Right here is an area. You see that negative? Because the pneumotaxic center kind of turns off the, the depth of respiration. Let me say that again. The pneumotaxic center, that's why the negative sign is kind of a negative. Now, if you kind of remember from ANP1, it's really doing an inhibitory postsynaptic potential, an IPSP, an inhibitory postsynaptic potential. Then we've got the apneustic center that's questionable in humans, but and it's stimulatory. Then we got something called the ventral respiratory group. The ventral respiratory group is in the front, the ventral area of the medulla oblongata. Then we got the dorsal respiratory group, which is at the back here. Okay. Then we got this pre boson to complex that's, that some add. All right. So these are the areas that control your breathing. Pneumotaxic, VRG, DRG. And to some extent, the apneustic, even though it's questionable. Okay. Those are the areas that control your breathing. Now we're going to go into those areas there and talk on them real quickly. Okay. So we have the DRG, the VRG, pontine centers, pneumotaxic, and the questionable apneustic. And this one, which is part of that, the pre Bosinger complex. <coughs> okay. Let's see what we can do here. The dorsal respiratory group is located in the back there. Okay. It was previously considered to be the main one to do inhalation, inspiration. Now remember, inspiration is active, so you need it, you need an inspiratory center. That for years was considered to be what spontaneously started you to breathe. Then we found this pre boson accomplished is a cluster of inner neurons in the ventral medial medulla of the brainstem has been proven to be essential for the generation of respiratory rhythms in mammals. Okay. It actually governs the rhythm, it seems like, by riding herd or checking on the BRG and DRG. Okay, let's go further. Newer thoughts state that the DRG receives signals from the peripheral receptors that we'll talk about, peripheral stretch receptors, and communicates to the VRG. So new thought is, is that the VRG may be the main thing. The VRG. Okay, so there's questions on that. But we know it's the DRG or the VRG, and most commonly it seems right now to be the VRG. All right, which is, so that's the ventral respiratory group. Now, what the ventral respiratory group is this. If that is the, if that is the one that does inspiration, then it will spontaneously fire a ramp signal. It will spontaneously fire a ramp signal that will initiate inhalation. Remember, inhalation is active. So I want to start right here. I'm going to close this video right here. And I'm going to start right here at this VRG and ramp signal. But there is still some question. The DRG may be doing, doing quite a bit itself by sending signals to the VRG. And the VRG sends it to the somatic motor nervous system. But anyway, we're going to start right there. Okay.